that is Roman Wright, one of my very favorite gay adult uh, film entertainers. Oh yeah. He um he ha- I was on a group Tumblr once, like there where we just posted like funny stuff, mm-hmm. and uh, I just reposted an entire fan page Tumblr of his, <laughs> like every day, like one picture of him every single day because on Tumblr you can like cue things yeah. like robo post you know. And so, like, I trolled everyone with just never-ending pictures of Roman Wright. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I'm Johnny Jungle Guts, the top-notch gamer, a.k.a. the top-notch gamer. And today on the show, I have a friend of mine from really far back in the day here to talk about comics, Alex Gaylor. Hey, Alex guys. Beowulf Gaylor. Right? Mm. Alex uh, works for Boom Studios out here in Los Angeles. But we have known each other since high Long school. Long time, yeah. I was a freshman. A freshman you in were high a junior. school. I was a junior. What was your first memory of me? You were that awesome older student who took me into the comic club and we just always... We were the two people in the club that read comics. So we And no one else in the school was really into it as much as us. That's true. And we'd always come up with fun ways to make it exciting. We had like quiz games where people would get free comics. Uh-huh. We'd, uh, you did like a bunch of art projects and art prints for the club mm-hmm. it was oh, pretty yeah, great yeah, yeah that's right yeah we made a delusions of grandeur which was yeah. our comics club about that. yeah it consisted of the two of us and then uh a lady named hannah gold and then a friend erica who was kind of just there because she felt bad that there was only three of us in the club <laughs> it was kind of my the powerful du- team it was, it was great. a powerful team though but uh yes and we would go to like cons and stuff like i remember we went to the wizard Con world Philly. a bunch yeah. Oh yeah, that was with your brothers. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah. Your brothers were so funny when they were little. <laughs> yeah. Now they're very uh, muscular. Oh really? T- team up. Yeah, they are competitive about everything. So now, like working out, school, anything they can possibly compete over, they're doing it. I just remember. I think one of your brothers. Uh, he was all. He could have. He couldn't have been older than like nine or ten. I can't yeah. remember if it was Simon or Peter. But we were riding home from. Um. We're riding home from Comic Con, and he there a horse, in like a trailer pulled up next to us, and he just leaned out the window and he was like, "Fuck you, horse! <laughs> fucking nay, nay, fucking nay!" And I just started laughing so hard. It was like the funniest, like most surreal thing I'd ever seen to see this t- this like tiny little boy just start swearing at a horse. You know they do their own thing. They're always. Uh... Entertaining to say the least. Whenever oh I come into school, they would roll down the window and shout, "I love you! I love you so much! I'm gonna miss you so much! Have a great day at school!" <laughs> Which is a great way to enter high school. Oh yeah, when having your little brothers make you seem like a total mama's boy. Your mom is a real character too, as I remember. Oh my god, yeah. Oh, she's Firecracker. So funny. Um, and uh, and you would I remember you always getting. I love your mom, and you always would get so annoyed whenever she would like. She, she could take Go over. Off. Yeah, she does her own thing. She's oh my god! Powerful entity. Love her very much. Uh, but we went. F- you went from doing comic book club in high school. Where did you end up going to college? Um, I went to a small Vermont school that I love dearly called Bennington. Uh-huh. Um, and what's really exciting about that place is they kind of let you do whatever you're excited about. If you come to them with a vision of your future, they can help you make that happen. And I knew. I either wanted to be a teacher or in comics, so I kind of constructed a whole uh, study around that, usually like focusing on art, literature, animation, and anything that kind of was storytelling based. And um, instead of having winter term, they they basically had you go out and um, find an internship or passion or something to do that has to do with what you're excited about. So I went and I interned for Top Cow for a few years. Top Cow, yeah. And then um, a few others, Aspen and Zetascope. And then from there, I eventually got an interview, and then the rest is history. But it was great. And uh, Top Cow, just to go back a little bit, what, are some, what were some of the stuff they were publishing at that time? Um, a lot of Witchblade, some oh, Darkness. Yeah. Witchblade. Um, got to work on the encyclopedia for their entire history with uh-huh. some, a few friends. Sure. Um, yeah, and I actually work with a lot of those same people today. A yeah. lot of them work at Boom right now, which is yeah. pretty cool. So it's a small, it's a little small world. Uh, and uh, you, let's go back a little bit here, though. Because, mm-hmm. like I said, you and I were literally the only people in yeah. high school out of 400 that really regularly read and subscribed to comics. And that changed a lot for me, I think, when I went to CalArts. I guess mm. it was art school. I don't know why. There was a lot more comics. 
uh, people, but how did you get into comics sort of in the first place? You know, it happened around the time I moved to Pennsylvania. Um, I'd been moving around a lot, and I was... I know, I felt like a little bit of an outsider, you know, the classic teenager thing. New school, new places, I needed something to kind of escape into, and I found X-Men. Uh-huh. Um, which really, like, hit me exactly where I was at at that time. And uh, I actually started reading a lot of the novels first. Uh-huh. Um, and then from there, you know, all the Claremont stuff and the Morrison stuff just made me forever a comic book fan. And then all of Marvel, and then from there was, like, things like Preacher and Sin City, and then I couldn't stop. Yeah. Yeah. That, and what, wait, what were the, because I'm so, I always am fascinated by these, what were the X-Men novels that you read? Like, what was the, what were they talking about in those? There was one that was, like, pretty much an Excalibur book that I was really into. It had, like, Belasco, Nightcrawler. Oh, weird. Um, Shadowcat Colossus. That's cool. And those were my, like, that was my team. That was, I was all about the British little team, and all the X-Men were thought were they were dead. It was, like, Nightcrawler, Kitty, Captain Britain. Oh, yeah. That was my favorite thing as a kid. Anything Nightcrawler, really. But, um... The others don't stand out as much. I imagine they weren't that great, but uh, oh yeah, a lot of them are really bad. <laughs> but but some, it, yeah, some of the writers went on to do cool things. Like I know Christopher Golden wrote a bunch of them. Oh and yeah. Now he's like a nice. He's a good uh, comic writer and book writer. There's one uh, novel adaptation I know. It's uh, Star Star Trek X Men yeah. crossover. I had it. I never read it because I was never a Star Trek fan. But I like just wanted it. Uh, I just remember that they openly talk about how Picard looks just like Professor X <laughs> before Professor, you know, before yeah, before the casting. Patrick Stewart plays Professor X. It's such a mind twister thinking about all of that. And then also Picard and that Date Storm. That's my two. Really, I didn't know that from that story. But I read one. I remember that was like the original team of X Men. It was really bad. I think. <laughs> but, uh, so yeah. So then you got into the. Um, the, and you were, because that's the one thing I do remember about you, is you were very strictly Marvel in high yeah. school. That was like your... I was not into DC at all. I read Green Arrow, but that was about it. Oh, yeah? What Green was that? Kevin Smith? Uh, yeah. I was more into the... Listen, who wrote it? I forget. Back in the... Right when basically Green Arrow really established himself as a more adult series. Like, right before Vertigo hap was like a big thing and... Was it Mike Grell or like the I think Longbow so, yeah. Hunters or something? Exactly, that yeah. Was? Longbow Hunter and everything from there on, I was really into. Oh, I did yeah. Kevin Smith a bit later, but. Um, Those drawings were uh, pretty pretty great, I remember. I don't remember anything from that except. Me neither. I have the trades, I'm hoping to reread it. I think they're like sort of like almost like a watercolor style. I could be wrong about that. But, uh, but now I love them all. I like everything. A now lot. you're, now you're, yeah, more open to it. I was the same way, I think. I yeah. think I was. I, I used to say, oh, the only DC thing I like is Batman. But I think, um, I think I just didn't really understand, like, the sort of tone of the DC universe. Yeah, I would, I think it's, Marvel, and they, they're appealed to very different, like, parts of that mythos of superhero storytelling. Yeah. I mean, now they're a little bit, you can find a little bit of anything in any story if you look hard enough, but, um, Yeah. But at the time, it always felt like, as a kid, my whole, the POV was, like, these are, like, people dealing with struggles, and they happen to have powers, and it makes things harder for them, and it's this interesting little thing and then in dc it was like this very like mythos like gods the archetypes men. yeah the the mythical side of it whereas with marvel it's like they constantly want to beat you over the head with like they're human they're, they're human. going through this thing yeah and you're and because you're different that makes is that's hard you know? you're an outsider yeah no matter what you do right exactly even in a world of superheroes mutants are persecuted right exactly the mighty sort of that's sort of the mighty marvel Thing. but it's it's you know it's it's you get some powerful stuff there. oh i love it it's great like x-men uh wow why am i blinking god god loves man god loves man that man that blew me away as a child oh it's uh, that was the like groundbreaking for me it's iconic for those of you who don't know that was like the f that was like a x-men story where uh like an evil sort of evangelical minister is sort of the primary villain and they get more into like they sort of, that's, I think, where they were really went hard on a lot of the the sort of anti-mutant discrimination stuff for the first, not for the first time, but in, like, a, it was just, like, a really heavy way. Very overt about, like, the parallels between that and racism towards anyone, anyone in America, really. All different kinds of discrimination. I know for me, growing up uh, gay, that was, like, I immediately was drawn to that that narrative, especially the whole, you know, they get their powers when they're teenagers, <laughs> uh, thing. So, uh, I think, and I think just anyone, that's the thing that I think a lot of people can relate to. 
the whole the whole piece. Maybe too much. Like sometimes I think <laughs> I hear people say like, "Oh, I'm just like the X Men because no one understands me," <laughs> and I'm like, maybe you're just a dick. <laughs> maybe that's the reason. Well, what's great is you have so many years of stories. Like you can, it may have started out as that, and it might be the core at some point. But really, like X Men lends itself to anything because there's such an amazing cast of characters from all different oh, times. Yeah. And they've been created from everything from, like, the 60s to now. So you have, like, all these different eras of characters that have evolved through time. It's yeah. It's kind of beautiful and weird. Uh, it's so great to be talking about comics. I don't think I've ever had, like, such a comic person on the show yet. <laughs> really? What, uh, so what's, like, at the top for you in, in comics? Like, what's the best, the best stuff? Best is always hard because I feel like, I don't know. My favorite-wise, though, probably Preacher is one of my all-time favorite. Um, Scalped by Jason Aaron. Yes. Um, J.D. Mateus' uh, Compliot Moonshadow, I think it's one that, for some reason, has been forgotten, but it was absolutely groundbreaking when it came out. Tell me, let's talk about that. I don't know that one. Uh, it's one of Ray Bradbury's, actually, favorite comics of all time. He, like, his quotes on it many times over. Um, and it's J.M. D. Mateus? Yeah, and it's, like, one of the best. It was an epic comic, uh, which is, like, basically Marvel's Vertigo back in the day. Mm -hmm. I think it was before Vertigo. Um, could be wrong. But it's basically um, this really like beautiful fantasy story. Um, it's about a woman who has sex with the moon and has a <laughs> child, and it's very adult and strange. It almost feels uh, Gilliam-esque at points, but it's like Terry it, Gilliam. Yeah, and you kind of get lost in this journey. It's very beautiful and weird. I have a very va who draws it. Bill Sienkiewicz. It feels like that. I don't think it's him, but it's painted. Yeah, it's all painted and gorgeous. Yeah, that sounds like a one I should check out is it still in print do you think it isn't but you can get it on like ebay or amazon for like 20 bucks if you look around for it it's one of those ones that is sort of underappreciated so you can still get a hold of it yeah yeah i've got a few of those that what about you what made you fall into comics when was your it's almost impossible to say because i was like six years old like i don't yeah. i don't even know i mean my earliest memory is just playing the x-men arcade game at i mean once again it sort of starts with x-men the arcade, you remember the six-player X-Men arcade oh, game? Oh, it is, my, that is the most I've ever play, uh, spent on a uh, game in an arcade. Oh, yeah. I spent probably like $40, $50 just to beat that game at Disneyland one time. Right, it's definitely the colorful, it's definitely that colorful team of X-Men that you were sort of talking about. Yeah, there's even Dazzler, Dazzler. in there. <laughs> uh, An Australian Wolverine. Oh, right, yeah, in the, in the <laughs> card, because it was, I think it was going with a pilot for yeah. uh, X-Men show. Which I loved, as, I loved that VHS. I wore it out. Pride of the X-Men. That's right. Oh, Spelled yeah. like Kitty Pride. And in that, uh, one thing worth noting is uh, that, yeah, the um, the Wolverine in that for some reason. Aussie. I don't know where they were getting that from, but they it was so great. The animation is really beautiful in that show. Really kind of much better than the, the yeah. X-Men animated show from our our that actually, you know, went out and went to went to print. Not that that doesn't have its joys, too, but... Uh, so, yeah, so I just remember playing that, and then my dad or someone really sort of explained to me, like, hey, this is a comic. I think it was my dad, and he took me to the comic book store, and I said, uh, it was sort of a similar thing. I said, um, w uh, where's Nightcrawler? And the... People there said Nightcrawler isn't in the X-Men anymore. He's in a, another group called Excalibur. Uh, and so the first comic I ever bought was this really bizarre issue of Excalibur where they're, like, traveling through the multiverse. Hmm. And so, like, they're in, like, a weird joke world where, like, Daredevil, like, is, like, really blind and can't do anything. Or, like, <laughs> the Fantastic Four's powers are all swapped. So Sue has, like, the Thing's powers and, like... Just really, really weird stuff that, in, to my, like, little six-year-old brain, didn't make any sense. <laughs> like, I didn't have any point of reference for any of this stuff. and But I was just fascinated at how rich I could sort of tell it was. And uh, and then I just never, I never stopped since. But, uh, yeah, that was kind of my entry point into it. Um, so, uh, so, so, say again, what did you get a degree in at Bennington? What was the final <laughs> thing? Well, at Bennington, it's, uh, you get a liberal arts degree, and then you get to add on, basically, with a focus in blank. Yeah. Uh, so I proposed to my professors a, I'd like a focus in just, like, comic book study or whatever that Oh, meant, my narrative. gosh, that's great. So, yeah, and I took just, like, basically classes I felt would help in understanding the medium and bettering it. And since, I don't know, I love comic books so much because it's, you're approaching storytelling from so many different angles. Like, even the letters is, like, 
it's a vital, vital, like underappreciated part of the like creativity. And coloring, a coloring, I think, is one of the most underappreciated. It's yeah. I feel like we're luckily at the changing point now. When you have like you can have celebrities like Jordi Belair that are changing it, but um, we still have a long way to go. Matt Hollingsworth, I think of as one of the top colorists. Mm. I don't know if you know him, but he does a lot of stuff that I always somehow I always kind of sense when it's him. Uh, and uh. Yeah, that sounds that sounds kind of like hamster college where you create your own major, you know. It's like a realistic version of the movie Accepted. Yeah, Accepted. I don't know that movie. Uh, Justin Long. Uh, oh, okay. Jonah Hill. It's starting to come back to me. It it wasn't a hit, but it was all right. It was like an early one. Here, can you read me just this little part here after the after yeah cross out the Dirt Dragon. The Dirt Dragon, which has not been mentioned in the walkthrough yet, can be found by returning to the Opera House okay, and speak there. to impress Sario. Okay. Approach the switches you used last time you were in the Opera House and pull the one second from the left to allow you to access the Dirt Dragon on stage. That's a total of six. The remaining two are found in Kefka's Tower. Okay. And will be covered when you reach them at the point in the walkthrough. All right. Okay. So I just need to find some switches. I'm sure I'll find it. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Wait, which switch am I supposed to pull? Does it, does it say? The ones you used last time you were in the Opera House. Okay. And pull the second one from the left. Second one from the left. Okay. I see it. To allow you to access the dirt dragon. All right. So he's like the pig pen of dragons. Uh, we're about to find out. But he's like the earth dragon. I feel like that language is probably a little bit. All right. So I bet I just have to go back up top. So uh, so let's talk about boom. All right. Because a lot of people don't even really realize how many other people besides Marvel and DC do comics. I mean, they yeah. kind of, I think I think some people know that there's a there's sort of an indie comic scene, but mm -hmm. even beyond even besides just that, there's so many different publishing companies and a lot of them doing really really interesting creative work. Uh, what do you, how, what can you tell me about how Boom sort of got started and and all that stuff? I oh, mean, I don't I don't know if I can speak for Boom on how they got started, but um yeah, I I, guess, I think the industry it's uh comic books is just, you know, it's a medium that's more than superheroes, though superheroes are amazing, and I read them very often. Yeah. Um, it's just, you know, it's an incredible platform for storytelling. You can do things that you can't do anywhere else. That's absolutely and right. And you have this amazing thing, and I think you only find things like, I don't know, you find it rarely in storytelling, where all these people are coming together to tell the same story, but they're all controlling one different aspect, and then by the end, you have this unified vision where every part is working in tandem beautifully, hopefully, mm -hmm. if it, they did the job right. Yeah. But we're also at a point now in comics where non superhero stories are selling really, really well, which is oh, great. Yeah. Like Image has been doing a phenomenal job. You know, things like Walking Dead are beating out most Marvel DC books. Sure. Which is crazy. Like that's hasn't happened in forever. Never. Um But yeah, boom, you know, I think it's just powerful storytelling. Like we always make sure uh if we're telling a story it's something we really care about. And sure. uh because of it, I don't know. It's been amazing. Working for the company has been a dream come true. And you're an editor over there. Uh, associate editor. Associate editor. What uh, books are you working on right now? Right now, um, the John Carpenter crossover, uh, Big Trouble in Little China, Escape from New York. <laughs> wow. Which is so much fun. The it's Kurt Russell, Russell, the Kurt Kurt Russell, Russell extravaganza. extravaganza. Hopefully one day we'll get McCready and Elvis, but who knows. Wait, who, what movies are those Kurt Russell movies? Uh, this from? is the other John Carpenter, uh, Kurt Russell movies. The Thing is The maybe Thing one? and Elvis. Oh, and just Elvis Presley. Yeah, he course, did a. Yeah. I think it was a TV movie. Okay. Um, but yeah, uh, beyond that, I'm doing. Uh, I'm trying to think of what's announced yet. I'm doing Kong, King of Skull Island, which is uh -huh. fun. Um, uh, all the Power Rangers stuff. You're on everything you're on Power Rangers. All that. Yeah, it's great. And that's now. Let's talk about that series because I'm. I was really. Uh, I think I've read three or four issues of it, and I'm just very impressed because when you think about Power Rangers and the history of it, and some of the writing on the show, you don't necessarily. You, there's a lot of. There's actually a lot of amazing sort of weird things about Power Rangers. But, oh yeah, it's a bizarre universe. But you wouldn't. It's it's so amazing what you've done with it because you really take it kind of very seriously in oh, yeah. this way. I mean, I think Kyle, the writer, who's absolutely amazing, he puts it best, which is like, I'm giving you the Power Rangers you remember, not necessarily the Power Rangers if you rewatch it. You know, I've loved for it all, but Kyle's really delivering this thing where you just, you fall in love with these characters in this universe. It, it almost feels like um, Winter Soldier meets uh, the X-Men in some ways. 
Yeah, they definitely, um, they definitely sort of get into it with, uh, with like a lot of different, but it's, it never goes, it never goes, there's also that other route that some comics will go where they'll go like, right now they've got the like zombie Archie comics and those are great. Oh, I I love everything Archie's doing right now. They're absolutely amazing, but it's obviously like this very, um, uh, it's obviously this very dark thing, uh. And, of course, then there's the other route that sometimes you see where, like, people just think, oh, we gotta make this, uh, Edgy, grittier, yeah. and it just bombs. I sort of feel like that's what d- the DC film universe might be mm. missing a little bit right now, uh, their he, thing. Yeah, I mean, I think Kyle's just really, like, he's created this character-driven narrative with a lot of heart, relatable characters, um... Because it doesn't go too far into that territory. It's yeah, I still mean, in that sort of warm Power Rangers world in a lot of ways. But yeah, I mean, it's just like, a lot of these things these people go through in the show, if you stop and think about it, it's like, they're going through some heavy shit, especially for teenagers that are still having to be like A-plus performers, doing everything in their life, and they have this giant responsibility of someone like Tommy, who in the show, he was just a kid on the street who got possessed because he could do karate really well. Yeah. And then... He was, had this whole responsibility thrust upon him, and then he became a ranger with this team that's already been working as a unit for a long time by that point. And the artist, uh, the drawings are fabulous. Yeah, Henry Prosetti is great. What else has he worked on? He worked on a few things at Top Gal, but I think his uh, longest run was with Power Girl back in the day. Oh, okay, yeah, for DC. Mm-hmm. So from Power Girl to Power Rangers. Very different, but both full of power. Uh, and then, th- and then there's even a solo Pink Ranger yes. comic too. Are you, are you on that one mm-hmm. a little bit? No, it's a lot of fun. Now talk to me about why of all the Power Rangers to go solo series on, you went with Kimberly. You know, I think she's an underappreciated one in it. I, I can't speak to the company, but I can say that like, we were really excited about the idea of doing a great Pink Ranger story. She's such a great character. Sure. Um, there's some really interesting things to mind there and I feel like. The obvious choice would have been doing, like, the Red Ranger or something, but going at it this angle, there's, it's, green, it's exciting, yeah. yeah. And, um, yeah, I don't know, I, I think it was just a great story that was pitched to us. We were really excited about it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's right after she leaves the team in the third season of the show, basically, she leaves to go join the Pan Global Games, which That's is basically right. their equivalent of, like, the Olympics. Sure. And she's not really heard from again, except for one, uh, for the Turbo movie. Sure, there's a little cameo. Yeah, and so this was kind of... You know, we wanted to give fans that great story where it's like, what did she do afterwards? How has her life been affected by this giant thing that was a part of her life? Yeah. And honestly, how were a lot of the other Rangers who make appearances in this in the comic lives affected by it? Sure. And like, the creative team has been amazing. Daniel Diniacula, I think I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah. The artist is just phenomenal. He oh, blows yeah, me away great. every single issue. Sarah Stern on the colors is amazing. And the story Kelly Thompson and Brennan Fletcher constructed and now Tini Howard's writing is just great. And Brennan Fletcher, he writes uh, Black Canary, too. Black Canary, Batgirl. Um, yeah, he's doing a lot of great things at DC. And I think he has uh, an original image, I think. Oh, right okay. Now. But, uh, yeah, that's just like, I don't know. The Why I love comics so much is you have people like us that are like, you go into it because you love it. Like, there's passion. And there's not really any of that, like, you find in other industries where it's like power hungry or trying to make something more of something. Mm-hmm. Everyone's there knowing they're there because it's something they love. And there's sure. not really much beyond like stepping in the way of that. Sure. It's very true. Well, how did you end up here? I'm curious. Like, how'd you end up in Los Angeles and you uh, do the marketing for Comics vs. Toys? Yeah. I mean, th- that's another crazy part of this story is that we're both out here because, you know, we did the comic book club together in high school and then I just walk into my comic book store, Comics vs. <laughs> Toys, where I've gone for a trillion years. And uh, and there you are. That it's, was the straight, like, one of those small world moments. It's such an insane co- coincidence. And in a lot of ways, you know, comics is really big. Is a, There's a lot of comics that get published. But at the same time, I really think that it's kind of a small world, too. A hundred percent. And uh, so I came out here... Well, it's funny because I originally started doing art because I was thinking about storytelling around comics and how to how to understand comics a lot better. And then I sort of just, uh, I guess, 
got really into just doing art and then came out here for art school eventually. I went to Savannah College of Art and Design mm. and, uh, for a little bit because they had a sequential art department. Yeah. Uh, one funny coincidence, I think a guy who draws, um, I think he draws the Steven Universe comic for Boom, his name's Jeremy Cerisi, Mm -hmm. he went, was a roommate of a friend of mine at SCAD, I'm sure he doesn't remember. Really? Oh, you went to SCAD? Yeah. Oh, shit, yeah. For a little bit I did. Yeah, yeah. But then, um, it was kind of a weird transition for me because I was going from West Town, which was such a weird, small school where you could just walk to everything, and SCAD is this huge campus that's spread across the entire city, it's just a huge school, so I, it wasn't the best fit. But it was a funny coincidence because I was looking at Boom stuff today and there was Jeremy. I'm sure he doesn't remember me. But his roommate, Brennan, was a friend of mine from that time. We act, we work with a lot of people from SCAD, actually. Yeah. And we actually have some people that have uh, went to SCAD who work at Boom. See? Yeah. If I'd stuck it out, I'd be in the comics <laughs> industry now. Hey, never too late. It's never too late. And, uh, and so I came out here, I got into art, and uh, a lot of that art stuff uh, has revolved around this sort of different ideas about comics and fandom like i did a art show that was like 800 plus drawings of pokemon like floor to ceiling i think i remember on the internet when you posted a post on that yeah and that actually did pretty good i got some press like some art in america articles and stuff but uh uh yeah so i came because i came to cal arts because it was kind of like a weird uh cool art school and that's how i ended yeah. up in california but, uh, yeah, it, uh, it's still uh, something I think about a lot. And Comics vs. Toys, I, I love going over there every week. It's a great shop. And uh, seeing, seeing Ace and Chris. It's hard finding a comic book store you like, you know? Well, it's like finding a, like a little community or home. I think it's the way I never had religion. So I feel like it's like finding your church, I imagine. Mm-hmm. You know, because it's a place you go to quite often. You get to know the people who go there. Mm-hmm. You get to become like a, it's a, part, of, it's a part of your life. I think about religion a lot in relation to just comics in general, um, and just different sort of science fiction, fantasy, fantastic fandoms in general, because it's, it's, it's like religion, but it's also different because it doesn't take itself too seriously, mm-hmm. or hopefully it doesn't. There's some crazy fanboys out there, but I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think it has to go with, like, everything, anything you're passionate about or, like, really devote mm-hmm. to. And as a comic fan, like, you probably read a lot of things. Oh, yeah. You're coming back every single week, month, whatever it is, to continue your narrative, which will never end. Yeah. The narrative only ends when you decide it ends. Even yeah. if your store book is canceled, there's probably something else out there that's adjacent to it. Yeah. Yeah, I always talk about it being a little bit like comics were my People magazine, Us Weekly. Like, I need, like you know, the way people need to know what celebrities are doing. Yeah. Oh, 100%. I need to know what that, was, that woman is doing. That was my know? experience chasing the dragon. Yeah. <laughs> It's like what's happening next to next, but I need to know. As a, when I was in uh, middle school or sometime around that age, I had always believed I'd outlive everyone else because I, I was like, I'll always need to know what happens next to next man, and that'll keep me going. It'll keep you alive. These things keep us alive. This is the pa- having these passions. It really, it really brings color to your life. It's amazing. I've kind of lost it though. I haven't. I don't do singles very much. Um, yeah, I'm in that boat right now too. I do the trade because I like. I have I read so much every day. Like, rem- I won't remember. I won't remember enough to go. I'll have to reread everything. I'd rather read the entire arc of a story. Yeah. And then put it on the shelf, and it's nice and pretty, and then you can give it to friends. It's so nice reading. I do. I mean, I don't do. I buy the trades now too, just because I don't know what to do with the single issues. I, yeah, exactly. I'm not a collector exactly in that way, you know. And it also sometimes seems like collectors, and there's nothing wrong with being a collector at all, but sometimes it seems more just about having the thing than maybe even reading it or knowing yeah. what's going on. It's I think it's a lot, I don't know, it's the way I treat toys in some ways. Yeah. A lot of people treat single comics and getting all the variants and stuff. Mm-hmm. Variants are so much fun. Like I Once I go down that rabbit hole, it's, there's no return. And you guys have done like a million variants for Power <laughs> Special Rangers. Special for Power Rangers, yeah. There's uh, just a, it's such a big world full of weird, fun things. Who are some of the people you got to do variants for Power Rangers? Oh, like, I don't even remember. Names. Like, the first issue had 26, 28 issues. Yes. 28 covers. Amazing. Um, that was a challenge. That was a great challenge, but it was like... To coordinate as an editor. Oh, yeah. Because you have to manage so much. Also, it's not, you know... It's a licensed book, so there's approvals and whatnot. Luckily, you know, licensing on that book and... Honestly, all the books I'm working on are f- is fantastic, but... Um, right, you have to go through that whole process. Oh, yeah. It's um, licensing is a little bit different and harder to coordinate than 
other ones. I mean, that's not true, but they're they're different. Um, and where does it start? How do you start off? You like, does someone at Boom say we want to do Power Rangers, or do they come to you? Um, it goes either way. Um, I know I often bring <laughs> way too many options of things I want to see as oh, comics. Oh, really? Just pages. When I first started, I I, I took a side of people. I was like, so would you guys be opposed to me bringing you like ideas for licenses? Because I have some. Like, sure. I'd literally bring like a hundred ideas every month. Let me guess, the Monster table. Squad was that one of them? Almost every month. Yeah, you were. I still to, try you, to pitch that you one. You were just just gunning for Monster. Oh, Squad. 100 percent. I, I still think it. Monster Squad would be a you hit. You love it, uh, and uh, and uh, so so with Power Rangers, you mm -hmm. who do you get in touch with? Ham Saban. Um, the the, the, Saban owns the company, yeah. um, but it's uh, Saban Brands. Um, mm -hmm. Some great people there. We, you know, it's basically just like an added component to the the whole team. You know, you run things by them for approval. You hop on the phone, talk about things, and they're great because Power Rangers is such a giant history. It's insane. It's twenty what seasons now? People don't realize that Power Rangers. There's a different season of Power Rangers almost every year. Oh, and it's entirely complicated. New histories, universe. Like the rules are never the same. And it's the story is never presented in a way like here is our history, here is the character. No. You have to decipher that shit. Oh yeah. Like I re I rewatched uh, the whole first season in a month to prepare. Uh huh. And it's just like there's so much. It's sixty episodes for the first season. That's inc that's crazy that they. And the funny thing about that too is uh, Cal Arts, where I went to uh, college, that town Valencia is actually where they shot a lot of those episodes. Really. So you can sort of see that California landscape that goes... So Because for those of you who don't know, I'm sure most of the people listening to this probably know this, but Power Rangers consists of footage from the 70s. I think it was the 70s? I, I don't know the era. I don't know the era, but uh, what they call a Sentai show from Japan. Yeah, Super Sentai. Uh, Sentai Zoo Ranger, I think, is the name of that, that first show. And uh, they spliced that in. That's like all the sequences where the Power Rangers are morphed. And then they splice that in with the... Uh, Americans the doing well American. in school and going to the juice bar. Exactly right. And Balkan Skull, the heroes of the show. Yeah, they add those guys in. And uh, one funny twist I always think about is that in the um, Japanese version, actually, the Yellow Ranger is a guy. Yeah. But then in the uh, American version, of course, she's a girl. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they're still using that old footage, so there's a sort of a funny sort of queer uh, undertone to that to me a little bit that mm. I think is sort of interesting. Just happening yeah. sort of through this cycle of media. But uh, anyway, uh, there, there's so many uh, seasons of it, and uh, having moved out to L.A., there's actually it's a, there's a huge fan community for it. Yeah, we have Morphicon. Right, and I, never under, I didn't understand that for a long time, and then I realized... The thing about Power Rangers is if you put on a pretty good Power Rangers cosplay and, like, learn some martial arts, you can look and seem just like a Power Ranger. Oh, yeah. If you can learn how to, like, <laughs> flip around and stuff, which people have surely done, you can seem just like a Ranger. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a lot, there's a lot of access there, I think. It's honestly, like, surreal working on things that, like, you grew up with and bought the toys and dressed around the house and ran around. Uh-huh. Doing everything you can to be a part of these things. It's so crazy. And uh, and what about with uh, the John Carpenter stuff? How did mm. you how did you set that whole thing up? Oh, I mean, the company set up the projects and stuff. But um, yeah, it's sure. just it's like project management, and basically you just get to become really good friends with your the group of people you work on and become pen pals and uh -huh. talk about story, give each other like top of the phone, talk everything about whatever basically, and get each other inspired and excited. Sure. And uh, another Boom comic you recommended to me was, it's called The Woods. Mm -hmm. Do you want to explain maybe a little bit what that comic is about? Sure. It's um, during an everyday, you know, high school classroom sort of situation. Everyone's just having their normal time. The lights beam through and everything shakes and basically this entire school is transferred to another planet. And it's chaos. It's like Lord of the Flies the teachers be basically run the school like a dictatorship. It's really, really fun, great character story. Um, amazing cast. Really amazing world. And what I love and really appreciate about it is it just always goes further. It's mm -hmm. always expanding on the world and taking turns and twists that you never expect. It's never confining itself to a narrative. It's set in this alien oh. woods, yeah. And what I really liked about it, too, was that I did a lot of student government in high school. You did a little, I remember. Yeah. And it really reminded me of all of that sort of bureaucracy of just, like, teachers being, you know, sometimes just as weird as students. 
and not uh, and yeah. having to work with different people in this like kind of funny community. But uh, yeah, it's great. It's by James Tinney, and he also writes. Remind me again, what other stuff he writes? Uh, Mimetic, Batman Eternal, I think is the one. Sure. Um, but yeah, he's fantastic. Yeah. And uh, what are some of the other big projects over there right now? Um, we have Gotham Academy Lumberjanes crossover. Oh, right, that I saw. That's a really funny yeah. crossover because you're crossing yeah. over with DC. How does that work? I mean, yeah, it's another one of thing where I think people above me are having those conversations. They get really excited about these potential combinations of and it, it made perfect sense like those two teams are just so perfect together there's a very similar visual style gotham academy i haven't read it it's obviously set in the batman world it's drawn by becky cloonan and maybe uh, she, is that I'm, who draws it i'm not sure I, it, it's been a while since i've read it, it i think it has a few uh, artists but I, it, I think it features some younger female characters maybe kind of tomboyish and then lumberjanes sort of the same yeah, it's a summer camp where crazy things happen and there's fantasy monsters and basically friendship always brings them together sure and uh and so it's like uh and they both have this sort of like very sort of uh, i guess i don't know what word i would use maybe sort of twee almost uh indie comics type vibe to them yeah and so they go together really like, what have you been reading what have i been reading lately no. um well i really like the new midnighter uh mm. the from steve orlando i thought that was like one of like kind of the best one of the best portrayals of a gay superhero i'd ever seen it's great uh and uh you know uh not sacrificing any of the sort of hardness of midnighter just because uh it's sort of like dealing with these sort of more sensitive social issues and then uh i've been going back through actually and reading christopher priest's black panther i picked them up i haven't read them story arc I'm real. I'm really into it. Christopher Priest wrote Black Panther in the early 2000s, I want to say, and uh, and it's really a lot about the way the U.S. does not handle foreign policy well at all, and sort of like international relations bureaucracy. But it's really fun too. Mm. It's all told uh, from the perspective of a guy, Everett. I think his name's Everett Ross, who's sort of like the Black Panthers government liaison mm. type. Um, guy from and he's in the movie he's going to be played by he's in the british office he looks like a hedgehog <laughs> he's he was in the hobbit too i think i can't remember his name martin something martin freeman martin freeman wait from civil war yeah he's bri appears briefly in civil war as a lead-in into the black panther films he's going to be playing everett ross in those and i think that's that's a great cast choice frankly uh but yeah so i've been really enjoying that um, I've really enjoyed... Did you read Kaiju Max? Uh, I've read some of it. I love him. He is such a... Xander Cannon is an amazing... Have you read Heck? No. If you like that, you gotta check it out. It's his, like, Dante's Inferno. Mm -hmm. It was nominated for an Eisner for years ago, I think. Oh, really? But it's fucking phenomenal. It's one of my favorite books the past few years. Heck, it's called? Yeah. I'm gonna look it up, because I love Kaiju Max. Kaiju Max, uh... It's adorable and sad. And it's so sad. It's so incredibly sad. It's... I was hesitant at first about it because I will say some of the coloring and the inking on it was seemed a little bit too uh, too bright and shiny for me. But it is uh, it's about a prison for giant monsters, and it really you wouldn't expect to have like a really strong emotional response to something like that. Uh, but I think I think it I had me in tears at some point. Kaiju Max, so I, I'm. And I can't wait to see the, the next trade in. There's been a lot of comics. Like, Bitch Planet is mm -hmm. sort of about prisons, too. I think that, did, yeah. Did you read Kennel Block Blues from... It's great. I haven't. didn't read that. It's like um, where all the dogs and cats go. It's kind of like the... Uh, like, uh, their prison system. It's really oh. weird. It kind of bursts into a musical every once in a while. But it's not an animal shelter. It's a no, they're like, dog they're like, prison. They have like ant, but they have, like, uh, human kind of anthropomorphic features and sure. stuff. Sure. Yeah. Um, it's like Oz meets, I don't know, Wizard of Oz. <laughs> yeah. That's not, the, the thing about Bitch Planet that I always think about is, like, I don't know if you've watched Orange is the New Black, that show? Only the first two seasons. Right. And I'm the, in the exact same boat because I really kind of just felt at a certain point, like, it didn't really feel like prison. Prison at all. At it was, all. It felt like summer yeah, camp. It, that's just not for me. And I just think that if it was in a futuristic setting, I couldn't really have that complaint because you yeah. have no idea what <laughs> prison is like in the future. So that, I mean, it just makes me 
wish Bitch Planet was a TV show, basically, is what I'm saying. Maybe one day. It's pretty big. It was a big, it was a big comic. It was a big, uh, it was big for that, that year. Um, and, uh, and, uh, you guys do, like, Steven Universe and Adventure mm-hmm. Time. All yeah, all the guys. Cartoon Network goodies. Um, what are some of the other ones of those? Over the Garden Wall. Have you seen that miniseries? I have been told it's really cute, but I have not watched it It is yet. incredible. It's yeah. one of the best things I've ever done. Highly, highly recommend it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you and they do, there was a comic time. Yeah, for actually the uh, creator, the first trade, which should be out or coming out, is fantastic. It's basically a lot of his, like he wrote it. Uh, yeah. And then one of the uh, people who's an animator on it did the art. That's um, so It's great. like lost episodes, more or less. Oh, yeah. But uh, the sh- the show is absolutely incredible. Do you watch Adventure Time at all? Uh, I would say I'm not, like... I feel like Adventure Time is, like, I've definitely watched plenty of episodes mm-hmm. of it, but I'm not, like, one of those Adventure Time... Yeah. Or Steven Universe is the same... I feel the same way. Like, I've, I've watched plenty of episodes, mm-hmm. but I'm not, like... Those shows are sort of, like, Prince, in a way. Like, Prince has so <laughs> much music, and people are such an expert on it. Like, when you say you're a Prince fan, you really have... You sort of feel this, like, obligation yeah. to be bringing something to the table, but... Uh, but, so, yeah. I've seen some... I've definitely seen a fair amount, but I'm not, like, a... a I think, it, yeah, it's... I can't imagine trying to get into it at this point. Because they're like 60 episodes per season. And Mm -hmm. it's a giant narrative that's expanding in a way that's kind of very unique to television, I think. Yeah. Uh, It's not just like story to story to story. It's like you're slowly building out these worlds and these characters. And you kind of find this sadness in this world as it goes along. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and it's funny because Adventure Time seems so pared down at first, you know? It was, like, the princess and the evil Ice King, and you got Jake and Finn, and that was kind of the crew, and then it just sort of exploded. Well, yeah, you realize the implications of the world. It, it doesn't just do the surface level. It, you find that everything is, like, really rude in this very bizarre, dark, sad, strange, beautiful creativity. Really? I'm going to have to look into that. that sounds, I'm going to have to start watching it more. Uh, cause, um, <laughs> I have, I will admit to watching all of My Little Pony Friendship Magic. <laughs> I only watched a few episodes. It, it's a, it's a very specific thing and I understand why it drives some people crazy, <laughs> but I crossed like an, I think it was a personal emotional barrier with that show mm. and it is, I guess it was an aesthetic one too. Cause I don't really, the animation is sort of in flash. It's not the yeah. best. But I think part of that makes it really easy for fans to draw, sort of like the Power Rangers thing. Like, yeah. people can dress up and do it. So that point of access is sort of cool. It's almost like punk in a way. Like, the hmm. three chords that, if you know how to yeah. play it, you can draw my little... Well, comics. I think, like, Tumblr comics is the same way. It's, like, becoming, like... It's amazing, and it can... It's, like... I don't know. There are all these things. Animation, comic books. Every medium is finding a new outlet to really explode and, like, get these amazing creators. And there's so much to these fandoms now, you know? Yeah. It's really, it's really, uh, it's really incredible. You ever thought about doing a webcomic? Uh, I did a comic, I did a little comic once with a friend of mine, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think if I was to get into comics, I have a couple ideas for stories, but really I think I'd be more into it, like, what you're kind of doing, like, editorial Mm. stuff, because, uh, because I just, I just, I just want to be, like, a professional fan, you know? Yeah. I just like being a fan of things and, and pushing stuff and, and just being being uh, being in all that that sort of side of it. You, you should know? put together a uh, zine, an anthology zine. Yeah. That's going to be really fun. Just reach out to friends, have them contribute, have a theme. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good idea. Have you done anything like that? Not really. Um, it's interesting. Like, once your every day is, you know, working and doing the thing you love, it'd be... You end up doing it a lot less than when you get home. Oh, yeah, of um, course. Which has been both, like, good and bad. Like, I have now, like, hundreds and hundreds of books that I own and have on the shelf ready to read, but I just have not found the time to do it. <laughs> right, yeah. And did, did you just get sent those? Um, no, um, I mean, I get I get that from some Boom. Stuff. But, um, no, I just, like, you know, I'm, you know, once you're in that community and culture and you want to read all these things, you hear great things... Um, Boom does something that I think is, like, amazing and most editorial teams should do is we pick up all the new number ones, you know, from your shop, actually. Yeah. Um, so that we can, you know, look over them, basically keep current and, uh, invested with all the new books and know what's out there. Yeah. And so that way I can read most things. Like, actually, Christopher Priest is doing, uh, Deathstroke now. Oh, really? I didn't realize that. Uh, well, that's, 
That's the thing is, too, with, like, tr comics trades and stuff, you never know. I mean, a lot of it will go out of print after that first run. Yeah. So you got to go out there and get it. Uh, well, thanks so much for coming on the show, of Alex. Thanks for having me. It's so great to talk about comics. It's been a long time since we've hung out. Yeah, yeah. it's been a lot. We need to hang out more. Yeah, definitely. For a while there, I mean, because you... It's because you live over on the west side. Yeah. It feels like a whole different world. It is. <laughs> it is a whole different world. Especially with traffic. It's just like a giant... It's it creates the, these barriers between all parts of Los Angeles. It's like a... It's like a... I don't know. I just always think of Modern Family when I think of the west side. Because that's like where that... It's like so, that show in a way. <laughs> but, uh... There's a lot of cool stuff over there. There's like LACMA and stuff. So. Yeah. Tar pits. Like, the tar pits. That was the first place I ever... Like, when I first came to L.A. just to visit, that was the first place I wanted to go because in the Runaways, they live under the La Brea Tar Pits. So Yeah, I, it was for me, for it was Sin City. They had, like, a kind of warped version of it with the dinosaurs and stuff. Oh, yeah? Nothing like in the comic, but, uh, yeah. That was, it was, uh, but that was, like, the first place you went when you got here you wanted to go to. Yeah, I mean, because luckily, like, work was around the corner there, so definitely wanted to go there as soon as possible. It's so funny that we both had that like weird drive and it was both fueled by comics i think they're making a runaways tv series i heard hopefully it's good hopefully it's good that was Runaways the... is a hard one to pull off even in comics it seems yeah it kind of faltered after brian k vaughn has yeah and left. like amazing people like right like, yeah uh, joss whedon joss Barry whedon Moore. wrote it and it was like okay it's joss whedon and then it was like oh this isn't doing it for me it's like a hard team to capture the magic of it's hard well, anyway, this has been Let's Gay. I'm Johnny Jungle Guts. Tune in. We upload every week.